He is dead, and I, the self-serving coward that I am, still live. Life is not fair. There is no pattern. People die at random. Something everyone knows but no one truly believes. They think that when it comes to them, there will be a lesson, a meaning, a story worth telling. That death will come to them as a dread scholar, a fell knight, a terrible emperor. Death is a bored clerk with too many orders to fill. There is no reckoning, no profound moment. It creeps up on us from behind and snatches us away while we shit. Discussing the fifth book in the First Law series, The Heroes, by Joe Abercrombie. If this is your first time finding the channel, please know that all of my book reviews are spoiler heavy. I do Let's Discuss segments that are spoiler free and you can find those on the channel. So if you have not read The Heroes or the first four books in the First Law series by Joe Abercrombie, please bookmark this video and come back after you've read them because you're going to want to read them, trust me. Uh, with that said, let's get into The Heroes. Let me address the elephant in the room first, uh, especially if anyone uh, from the First Law Reddit page is, is going to be watching this. Uh, I was about 40% done with this book, and I was struggling with it. Most Abercrombie books are real page turners and overall fast paced, and a large chunk of this book is characters sitting around and waiting in what Gandalf would say the deep breath before the plunge of battle. Uh, so I went to the First Law Reddit page, which is a great community, by the way. Uh, almost zero negativity over there when you have constructive criticism. You know, they aren't looking to neuter you if you say you aren't really caring for a book. You know, unlike the Rothfuss uh, sub that actually banned me for saying I did not understand why everyone treats the name of the wind like it's the next Lord of the Rings. But, you know, I'm derailing my own video here. Uh, I, I griped in this thread over there on that sub saying that I felt like the heroes was a slow wheel of time book. Uh, now, that's not to say I need a ton of action. I mean, my favorite author is Stephen King. Uh, there's very little action in his books, so I'm not one of those types of readers that has a short attention span and needs, like, nonstop, you know, Michael Bay stuff blowing up or anything like that. What I meant was this is kind of like The Fires of Heaven, uh, the fifth book in the Wheel of Time series, where most of the first half of the book is characters sitting around campfires and talking about how awful, you know, their situation, their lot in life is. Uh, the good news is the second half of this book, it's vintage Joe Abercrombie and the twists and the turns and the backstabbing and the lots of stabbing. <laughs> uh, they all happen in a way you'd expect in a, in a first law book. Uh, first half, I kind of had felt like I was forcing myself to plow through. The second half, as per usual, I couldn't put the book down. So let's get into the particulars. Um, the Heroes takes place over three days, a battle between the Union and Northerners, now led by Black Dow, who we famously remembered uh, he, he betrayed and allegedly killed Logan Knife Fingers. That still has not been confirmed. Uh, that was at the end of book three. Uh, in this one, we get six new POV characters, you know, but a couple of them we've seen in the series before, or at least heard them mentioned. Let's start with the Union side, uh, Bremer Dan Gorst, who I was right about, and that he was the Kingsguard soldier that shivers through down the stairs in Best Served Cold. So, you know, he's been shamed and demoted due to this event, and he's now pegged to be the King's Observer during the, during the war. Yeah, he only watches and writes letters to the King, and even though he really wants to fight really badly. Uh, then we have Corporal Tunney. Uh, I guess you could best describe him as a war profiteer. Uh, he might be the most worthless POV character in this entire series up to this point. I mean, he's basically just there to show how some soldiers become career military men without even really fighting much. Uh, I always finds a way to avoid the battle, and I, I don't really know. You could remove him from the story, and I don't really think anything changes except getting a, a first-person observation of how... Jazal gave all of his old drinking buddies raises and how it pretty much screwed over Jalenhorn, you know, because it gave him a post at general that he obviously wasn't close to ready for. Uh, lastly, we get Finry Dan Brock. She's the daughter of Lord Marshal Croy, but more importantly, she is recently married to Colonel Brock, who is the son of the notorious traitor Lord Brock from the original trilogy. I'm using their, their, their proper titles because I can't remember their first names. Uh, just you see Brock and you think Brock. Uh, I think it's Her Her Herodan Brock. Uh, this is, I think, the normal first law political game, and it's, it kind of comes into view through Fenry in this. And that might be my favorite part of the story is, is Fenry and the political side on, on the other side, which is the North. And for the North POV characters, we get Kermden Craw, uh, 
to me, this is another attempt at emulating the nice side of Logan Nine Fingers, like they tried to do with Shivers in the first half of uh, Best Served Cold. And, but maybe not. Maybe all Northmen are just like this, you know, just very calm and relaxed until it's battle time, and then they're just, you know, crazy. But, you know, he's a straight-edge guy, savvy veteran, leads, leads about a dozen curls. I think, actually, a dozen, because he calls them the dozen. Uh, they're all in the service of Black Dow. Uh, his second is a gal named Wonderful, which I'll get into a little later. Uh, the son of Shama Heartless gets a POV in this, too. Uh, he's named Beck. I didn't really particularly care for this character that much, but unlike Tunny, I understand why he's here, and I think he does serve a purpose. It's to show all those 18-year-old kids that are real hotheads and think they're ready to go off to war and be a badass soldier like their dad was, and then they get there and they realize just how terrible and frightening and horrific war is. And then they just want to go home. I think at one point this he even says, I want my mother. <laughs> you know, so uh, the political side of the North, this is also my favorite side of here, is, is we get Prince Calder, a character I never really particularly gave much of a care about before this. Uh, he's the youngest surviving son of Bethed, a uh, younger brother to scale. Like Fenry for the Union, Calder's probably my favorite part of the book from the Nora. So the politics in this are, you know, on their own game. Everything we've come to expect from a first law book. And that's our six POV characters this go around. Now, the narrative in this book is so different from the other First Law books that I'm not going to do like I usually do and run down the plot and talk about everything I like because I feel like this is just so linear. Linear. It takes place over three days and it flips between the sides so much. I'm not sure I could give like a cohesive rundown of the plot. So I'll just go by the characters and groups here and talk about like my biggest moments, what I like, didn't like. And let's begin with the North. Um, not a POV character, but I feel like it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Black Dow here. So I feel like he's one of my original trilogy characters I got to talk about here. Uh, even as vile of a bastard as he is, it was fun to see Black Dow again. You know, it had, it had that going home feeling to it. Uh, I think this book shows he's a little smarter than he comes off in the original trilogy. Uh, there's a moment where he says if he knew it was going to be this much work to rule the North, he would have just tossed Bethage's chain into the river like he did Logan. Uh, I feel like he just came off as like just an insane, bloodthirsty psychopath in the original trilogy. But either ruling has changed him a little, or you got to take a step back and think, okay, everything you saw Black Dow in the original trilogy was all through Dogman's point of view, who already told you he did not like Black Dow. So maybe we just never see the intelligent side of him there. Um, besides Calder, I think he's the first one to say he wants to negotiate a peace with the Union and, and, end, and end this war. And he could have, probably should have, killed Scale and Calder long before this book if, you know, he didn't want to get stabbed in the back. Speaking of, I mean, that's awesome. I was shocked. I was downright shocked that Shivers was the one who killed killed Dow in this book. Uh, the whole story, I did not understand why Shivers was even working for Dow. Uh, I don't know what happened in the few years between Best Served Cold and this book. I think it's two years between the books. Uh... After Best Served Cold, I knew he gave up the whole trying to be a better man thing, and he just embraced who he was. But, I mean, he makes his move here, and then he aligns himself. I mean, he stabs, stabs Dow, says, I'm nobody's dog. Uh, he aligns himself with Calder, which, again, surprised me since, you know, if, if I recall correctly, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading this so fast, maybe I missed something here, but... I mean, I believe he was with everyone else in, you know, our, our, our group of... of of dogmen and all them, dogmen and all them, the, the uh, fighting method. So it's really confusing to me that everyone that was, a lot of the characters that were fighting Bethed in the original trilogy, they're now supporting Calder. I, I don't know, maybe they just like, oh, Black Dow is just too much for me. I mean, it's, I, it seems to me like maybe you guys just aren't ever going to be happy with who's ruling the North. So maybe the North doesn't need a ruler? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, about Calder, though. I think I liked his journey in this book better than anyone else because I feel like he goes from prisoner to reluctant fighter to basically king in a span of three days. You know, you always hear the cliche that war changes a man, and, and I think that's the overall theme of this book. Calder is incredibly ambitious, and he tries to get to the top, like Fenry, more by political maneuvering than action, you know, and he almost gets there until Baez shows up to remind him who the real power in this world is. You know, then he has the opportunity at the end to solidify his claim to the North. 
by uh, having Shivers kill Scale because Shivers is now like his second, and he's like, no big deal, you know, I'll, I'll kill Scale for you after Scale's released from prison. And that's what Baez is pretty much insinuated he wants him to do. You know, uh, we're going to release Scale from prison, and you, all you got to do is just take out this one last chess piece, and you're the king of the north. And, you know, <laughs> I will not lie. I was holding my breath during this. It was the second to last chapter of the book. called. It was titled Black Calder, too. So I'm thinking, okay, this is definitely, he's going to, you know, own that name. And he's going to kill his own brother and become king. I thought in typical Abercrombie fashion, I thought he was going to be like, I love you, brother, and turn his back and give Shivers the okay. You know, but the exchange between Calder and Scale in this moment is it was something really good. I really liked it, so I wrote it down here. Scale tells him, You were the one uh, took after our father. I tried, but I could never do it. I always thought you'd be the better king. And then Calder replies, Maybe I'm the better brother, but you're the elder. You know, and he gives Scale the chain. And Joe writes, I just love this. He says, He patted him on the back and left his hand there, wondering when he got to love this stupid bastard, when he got to love anyone besides himself. Just great writing. I, I think it's because we've gotten so accustomed to the characters in First Law just being completely heartless and brutal and vicious without a conscience uh, that, you know, when a selfless act like this shines through, it means that much more. So Calder definitely has the best arc in this book for me. And he goes, I mean, he even goes from being like, oh, my wife's okay, whatever, I guess, to being crazy in love with her by the end and even thinking about her, you know, right before he thinks Dal's about to kill him, his last his last thoughts are of his wife there. So, uh, very good arc. Very, very, very good arc. I hope we see him again, and I'm, I'm sure that we will in one way or another. Now, for the rest of the North, I, I thought Crawl was okay. I didn't dislike him, you know, but he could have died in one of his POV chapters, and it really wouldn't have gutted me or anything. I, I think I was actually more upset when, when Wirren died. I think Wirren was a really cool side character. I loved the, the whole thing with a sword. And, you know, someone told him when he was going to die, so he never he never wore armor in battles and stuff like that. Uh, so when he actually does die, it's like a big surprise to him. And he's like, you know, <laughs> I would have I would have wore more more armor. Uh, you, you know, you think for sure he's going to give this father of swords to crawl, but he actually asked to be buried with it along with his burden. Just powerful stuff that, you know, writing that you think, where is this going? But it has a payoff that matters. Wonderful was a somewhat interesting character. For some reason, I could not get... Um, Oh, geez, what's her name? The, the Practical, the Redhead Practical from the last book. Uh, last four books. Uh, I can't think of her name. I'm going, whatever. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't get the image of her out of my head with Wonderful. But uh, I think it's just because they kind of had similar personalities. You know, it, it, you think that she, with the opportunity given to go home and be with her, her, her husband and kids, and you find out later that, you know, she went there and they were either dead or gone. So this is what she is now when Crawl's trying to retire. And, you know, with uh, with Crawl's retirement cut short, you know, I figure we're going to hear about both of these characters in Red Country again because it doesn't seem like either of them are out of the game and both of them are going to have more prominent roles. As for Beck, while I think he's a mediocre character, like I said earlier, I understand why he's here and it feels earned. You know, not all farm boys leave home, follow in their father's footsteps and, you know, become the Luke Skywalker, you know. There's a part where he hides in a cupboard from Union soldiers and finally gets the courage to jump out and attack, and he only succeeds in killing one of his own guys. And this one moment basically breaks him for the rest of the story. The guilt just eats away at him, and he just wants to go home, you know. He doesn't want to be his father. He just wants to go home. And, you know, when he finally does get home, he tells his mother the one thing he learned out there is that he is not his father. He does not want that sword anymore. You know, it's a great reversal of the usual fantasy tropes that would have made Beck the next Randall Thor or something like that. Uh, over on the Union side of things, for the first half of the book, this is what really dragged for me. Uh, Baez and Gorst were basically all that really interested me. Baez, because it was the first time we'd really seen him since uh, Last Argument of Kings. And you see he's just as vile of a bastard here as he was then. <laughs> in fact, maybe even more so. Uh, but Gorse really interested me. But the generals and the majors and lieutenants, like measuring dick sizes for a third of the book about how they, everyone else is an idiot except them and how this person needs this title. And it just wasn't as interesting as maybe, you know, Polder and Croy was when they were doing it in Last Argument of Kings. I just didn't care. I didn't care about any of these generals. So, uh, 
I did kind of like Fenry. Fenry was always trying to undercut Mead, you know, governor of England, and place her husband in his position. I thought that was much more interesting, especially when Mead calls her out and says, you know what, this ain't my first rodeo. I know what you're doing. You know, I've played this game before. I know what you're doing. You best knock that shit off before I send you and your husband home. And then just goes right back to business. Like that conversation never even took place. I thought that was really, really cool of him. Um, doesn't end well for him, but you know, that's just that's just how these things go. So she's she's very, very ambitious, but she does need to keep that in check sometimes. And I feel like this kind of knocked her down just a little peg. Uh, but I'm still kind of blown away in this book. I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. I'm stunned how she talks to Baez and he doesn't turn her into vapor or something. You know, but I, I we have to think at this point, Baez always has a plan, you know. By placing uh basically placing her and her husband in control of England at the end, it's probably because he knows he can control them. Um but let's back up a bit on Fenry here. Uh I start talking about Baez and I'm gonna start going off. When her and Elise, that's uh, that's Major Brent's, or is it Captain Brent at this point? Uh, I know they all got promoted. One of them, just all drinking buddies, uh, his wife, Elise, they're, they're captured. Him and Fenrir are captured, and they're taking... Where they're taken, I'm pretty sure that Stranger Comes a knocking, which is a great name. Sounds like some Indian name. I love it. Uh, it basically sounds like... He's all the time talking about how he likes wants to be more civilized, wants to be more civilized. But I think it's like insinuated that he's about to do some raping here. And she basically, Fenry gets to leave because of her station, you know, who she's related to. And Elise has to stay. And man, it's just, that eats away at her the rest of the story. And like I said, knocks her down another peg. She's, she's still going to tell folks how she feels about things. But she's got some serious guilt to deal with, survivor's guilt, if you will. And it didn't seem to break her in the same way that it did Beck, though. So, I mean, she's still very much a player in this. I already touched on Tunny. I don't even know why he's here except to tie this in with Styria and Mansa at the end. Almost everyone under his leadership dies, and he writes some letters. I, I, I Like, one of his, one, one of the people in his, his, his platoon die, and he's just more upset about losing the bottles of wine on him. It's just, I don't know. I think it's just one of them to be like, hey, just a reminder, these are really bad people weakest pov character joe has ever written in my opinion but you know joe's still batting way up in the high 900s on these so i'm not going to give too much shit about it gorst is the real draw in the union characters here i think this is a guy who's been around since the first book he was cheated out of the uh, the whole contest thing by Baez. you know and now he's been disgraced and he's no longer head of Giselle's king guard due to what happened in best surf cold and little personal here i think as someone such as myself that has battled with depression in the past i think that's a big reason why gorse resonated with me you know that feeling of nothing you ever do being enough uh when you do do actually achieve something worthwhile worthy of recognition it seems like everyone around you gets more credit or recognition for it you know gorse is basically a fucking war hero by the end of this i mean he almost single-handedly saved their asses on that bridge and what happens brock the son of a traitor to the Union is going to get a parade when he returns to Adua. I mean, I get it, man. I've been there. It just, you feel like there's never anything that you can do that's enough. You know, his, his obsession with Fenry gets a little stalkerish sometimes, but, you know, it's not enough to diminish the character for me. You know, his fight with Scale is terrific. The, the stare down with Shivers was super tense. <laughs> I love Shivers' reply. Never heard of it. Uh, and his realization at the end that, you know, this isn't anything new. He was always this depressed and miserable, even before being disgraced. It's kind of heartbreaking. But, you know, depression is a mofo, man. It, it, mofo. It's a real, real solid character that I hope we see again. Uh, obviously, overall, if you just kind of listen to my previous reviews in this one, this is my least favorite of the first law books thus far. But hang on, hang on. Don't anyone get mad yet. However, I think the worst book in the first law is better than the best book in most fantasy series out there. I still had a great time with this book. I just don't understand why this is the one that is routinely picked among the fan community as the best in the series. And maybe that had my expectations a little super high because people told me, hey, you liked Best Served Cold a lot. Man, you're going to love the heroes. I like Best Served Cold way better than this. And maybe that's just because I like the, the the POV characters better than that one. I'm not sure. Who knows? Maybe this will change uh, on a reread one day. I mean, I get this book was, you know, kind of a theme on how Ward changes a man in a matter of seconds. 
You know, and speaking of that, there's something that Joe does in this book that he's never done this series, and that's he'll give you random POV characters for, you know, a chapter, a couple pages. There's, a, there's sections during the battle where he does something really, really cool. You'll be with one POV character for a couple of pages. And right when you feel like, okay, cool, I'm starting to get some interesting things about this, boom, they're killed. Then it shifts to the POV character that just killed them. Like this one guy's admiring this this stone that has like an engraving of his wife in it. And the guy that kills him picks up. is like, hey, cool, worthless stone. It's, you know, just show that one thing that means the world to someone else means nothing to someone else. And it just, it really, really just goes back and forth this for a little while. And it does gives you that idea of here one second, gone to the mud the next. And so Joe was writing a military book on how expendable lives are. I think he definitely hit a home run here by going back and forth between the characters that were killing each other. So there's only one book left and one short story collection before I'm waiting, like everyone else, for A Little Hatred. I already pre-ordered mine. I'm actually pre-ordered the UK version with the uh, with, that is actually signed, the limited edition that's actually signed by by Joe. So uh, I'll probably get that and the digital version so I don't have to wait you know, two weeks for it to be shipped to the States here. But uh, I'll get the digital version. I plan on definitely doing a review for that like immediately. I don't imagine I won't be speed reading that book. But uh, I plan to do Red Country in July and Sharp Ends in August. In the meantime, I've started rotating somewhat lighter, maybe, fantasy series into my schedule instead of going back to Wheel of Time right now. Uh, I already read and did a review for book one of Mark Lawrence's The Broken Empire trilogy, uh, Prince of Thorns. Uh, I also finished book one of Peter Brett's The Demon Cycle series last night. Very cool. Very different. And, and I'm finishing up the first short story collection of the Witcher books. All the while, I'm still kind of slowly working through Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, and then this morning, I started the first book of Pierce Brown's Red Rising Saga. So there's so no shortage of content in the channel here. Um, Speaking of the channel, uh, if you like this video, please consider subscribing because I'm trying to get up to at least 500 subscribers so I can beat YouTube's awful algorithms that won't allow any of my reviews to show up in just a basic search. Like if you go and just type in uh, Joe Abercrombie, the hero's review, my review won't come up probably. You'll have to actually find a link to it. That's why I have to depend on Reddit and Twitter and social media and things like that for these reviews to even be found. Uh, so I think I was around 320 this morning. So it's climbing. The channel is just going to keep growing. I do a book review or a Let's Discuss segment every week. And we also do the Geek Media Core Show, which is it's a live video show where we just talk about everything relevant that happened in the past week uh, in geek pop culture media. So um, thank you guys for commenting. If the discussion of the books is something that I never get tired of, so don't be shy about commenting or reaching out on Goodreads or Twitter. I've had people this week on Twitter reach out and say, hey, I found you through your book reviews. And, and, and I even had someone on Goodreads message me and say, you know, hey, you inspired me to get First Law. Uh, I'm checking it out now. I'm really enjoying it. Another person asked me, "Hey, uh, you know, being a, an, an adult with a with a job and, and, and kids and stuff, how do you find this much time to read?" Well, um, I take transit to work. Uh, it's an hour each way, so there's two hours. I have an hour lunch break. There's another hour, and then what I do when you know after I get get the kids to bed and, and get in bed myself for about so you're thinking three to four hours of reading per day, and I'm already a fast reader. Uh, that's how uh, it's it's like a lot of people ask me, "How are you juggling?" so many books i couldn't do it i have to get one book and focus on it until i'm done uh, to me it's like it's like watching multiple tv shows you know you're you're learning lore from different tv shows you're you're learning you don't just get one you're not like okay i'll watch this show but i can't watch this one because i'm watching another show to me it's the same way with books I, I can read several books at the same time i don't get them confused or anything like that but i love talking to you guys about this stuff so please don't be scared to reach out and, and have a chat off of youtube if you want to i'm always here to talk about it and we'll be talking again soon because uh, I got to do a review for uh, for this Demon Cycle book. So uh, have yourselves a good weekend.